Recently, I had someone on my channel post a comment saying they didn't need learning because they were saved by Jesus. The conversation didn't get very far before he deleted his thread. But if it had progressed, there is a strong possibility that the person would have quoted 1 Corinthians 8.1 to justify his ignorance. And today, we are going to talk about 1 Corinthians 8 on this episode of Ancient Egypt and the Bible. In many Christian circles, but by no means all, book learning is frowned upon. This is particularly true in churches that practice experiential forms of Christianity. Surprisingly, this can extend even to teaching of the Bible itself. And often, 1 Corinthians 8.1 is used to justify this form of Christian ignorance. The argument often goes like this, quote, Knowledge makes you arrogant, according to 1 Corinthians 8.1. Therefore, you are sinning and I don't have to listen to you anymore. End quote. So, it's normally used to end some other argument that is usually not going all that well. Now, what we are going to do today is read 1 Corinthians 8 and step through the text to determine the meaning of it. First, let's read the text. Quote, Now, concerning things sacrificed to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge makes arrogant, but love builds up. If anyone supposes that he knows anything, he has not yet known as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by him. Therefore, concerning the eating of things sacrificed to idols, we know that there is no such thing as an idol in the world, and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and we exist for him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we exist through him. However, not all men have this knowledge, but some, being accustomed to the idol until now, eat food as if it were sacrificed to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. But food will not commend us to God, we are neither worse if we do not eat, nor better if we do eat. But take care, lest this liberty of yours somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone sees you who have knowledge dining in an idol's temple, will not his conscience, if he is weak, be encouraged to eat things sacrificed to idols? For through your knowledge... He who is weak is ruined, the brother for whose sake Christ died. And thus, by sinning against the brethren and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food causes my brother to stumble, I will never eat meat again, that I might not cause my brother to stumble. Okay. So that's the text. Now let's parse this. Verse 1. Now concerning things sacrificed to idols, we know that we have knowledge. Knowledge makes arrogant, but love builds up. In verse 1, Paul sets out the overall issue that he's trying to address, which is idolatry and meat that is sacrificed to idols. Corinth was a place where pagan temples were not just places of worship, but were also administrative and civic centers. So public events would be held in these pagan temples, which often included dining. At those banquets, meat that was sacrificed to idols was often served. The other thing to note in this, 
in the context of knowledge being used in this passage is because chapter 7 immediately precedes this verse, and that was talking about the freedom to marry or the freedom not to marry, we know that Paul is not talking about book learning, but knowledge of one's freedom in Christ. Nevertheless, the idea that knowledge puffs up or makes you arrogant was a common maxim in its day. One that sort of makes intuitive sense in their day as well as ours. This is common Pauline discourse, where he takes a saying that is well known in the culture and leveraging off of it to apply it to something completely different. However, Paul is taking knowledge of freedom and weaving that into this common maxim. And even the idea of arrogance requires some explanation because it is the idea of thinking more of oneself or one's ability than is warranted. Yet here, that thinking more of oneself has to apply to our freedom because that's the kind of knowledge that Paul is talking about here. So he is trying to remind us that just because you are free in Christ to eat or not eat meat from idols, don't think that doesn't come with a responsibility regarding how you use your freedom. But then Paul adds a contrast with love builds up. This is not a direct opposite, but a corollary. Paul is not saying that knowledge is to be avoided, or even knowledge of one's freedom. Instead, knowledge must be tempered with love to make it effectual and productive for the kingdom. So we have to be careful here not to use verse 1 as a proof text against book learning, because to do so loses sight of the Pauline discourse. And this is typical of Pauline dialectic where he takes a popular quote from a philosopher or cultural wisdom and leverages upon it to make a completely different point. And there are times when Paul may not even agree with the original point, but that doesn't prevent him from leveraging upon it to achieve a greater teaching. Verse 2. If anyone supposes that he knows anything, he is not known as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by him. Verses 2 and 3. If anyone claims to know their freedom, then he doesn't understand his freedom and its responsibility. Knowledge of one's freedom must be expressed in humility. Yet, if anyone loves God, he is recognized by God. Verse 4. Therefore, concerning the eating of things sacrificed to idols, we know that there is no such thing as an idol in the world, and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom are all things and we exist for him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we exist through him. In verses 4 to 6, Paul then talks about idols. Idols are nothing, and there is no other God than the one and only, the Father and the Son, Jesus Christ, the Trinity. And even if there are, so-called gods. They cannot be compared with the one true God to whom we owe our life, existence, and salvation. Verse 7. However, not all men have this knowledge, but some, being accustomed to the idol until now, eat food as if it were sacrificed to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. Okay, in verse 7, Paul gets to the heart of the matter. Some people in his day still held that idols had power. 
and when they eat the food of idols, they're going to eat that food with reverence towards the idol. In Paul's day, there were many new converts to Christianity, but they were not set settled or secure in the Christian faith. So many of these new converts had ideas that where idolatry and Christianity intersected, and thus they could be easily shifted and moved in their faith because they were not yet firm in their foundation in Jesus Christ. Verse 8. But food will not commend us to God. We are neither the worse if we do not eat, nor the better if we do eat. In short, verse 8 is telling us that ritually pure or impure food will not make us better or worse in the eyes of God. We are not more spiritual if we do not eat, and we are not more spiritual if we do eat. Food is just food. It nourishes the body, but contributes nothing to our spiritual well-being. This does have implications for those who are still trying to follow the kosher food laws. Eating pork is a provision of the ceremonial law. But if you eat of it, or if you do not eat of it, matters not to God, since all the provisions of the Sinai Covenant have been satisfied by Jesus Christ. Verse 9. But take care, lest this liberty of yours somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. Paul, having covered that the eating of meat sacrificed to idols is nothing at all, reverts back to talking about one's knowledge of freedom, which he now ties to liberty. He completes the subtle shift from knowledge that one knows to liberty, knowledge applied and lived, because it wasn't intuitive to an Epicurean world that liberty could puff up. But he states that your liberty could be a stumbling block for the weak in the faith. Verse 10. For if someone sees you who have knowledge dining in an idol's temple, will not his conscience, if he is weak, be encouraged to eat things sacrificed to idols? Paul here is not concerned that the weaker brother is eating meat, but that through knowingly eating meat sacrificed to an idol, that could lead to participating in other things associated with idolatry, like idol worship. We should note that no one admits to being the weaker brother, yet they are ever present around us. Even today, there are weaker brothers among us. They are alcoholics drug addicts, legalists, vegans, and yes, literalists. As we exercise our freedom, we are to be discerning to its effect upon our weaker brothers. Verse 11. For through your knowledge, he who is weak is ruined, the brother for whose sake Christ died. Our freedom can spell ruin for the weaker brother. The weaker brother is also someone created in the image of God and for whom Christ died, and is worthy of our consideration. Verse 12. And thus, by sinning against the brethren and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. When you wound the conscience of the weaker brother through your acts of freedom, you sin against your brother and Christ. We should note that this does not forbid teaching the liberty of Christ and its knowledge. In fact, Paul doesn't want you to be ignorant of your freedom, just as he was not ignorant. But he does want you to edify all believers, whether the stronger or the weaker. Verse 13. Therefore, if food causes my brother to stumble... I will never eat meat again, that I might not cause my brother to stumble. Okay, 
This verse is hyperbole. Paul did not give up the eating of meat. However, he is trying to stress how important it is not to cause someone to stumble. In conclusion, 1 Corinthians 8 is not about book learning or education. Paul is using a piece of cultural wisdom that is floating in Hellenistic society to talk about our freedom and liberty in Christ and the abuse of that liberty. As such, there are some takeaways we can learn from this passage. First, be sensitive to what your weaker brother is going through. He's struggling with things that you might not even realize. Two, you have liberty, but be judicious in how you exercise your liberty. You can exercise your liberty. There's no question. You have freedom in Christ. Just be careful how you do it. Third and finally, don't be ignorant. Ignorance is not a Christian virtue. But be sensitive to the weaker brother around you. So, anyway, thank you very much for watching. We hope you learned something and you enjoyed this video. We will see you next time on Ancient Egypt and the Bible.